All right, so again, uh, very good morning to all of you. I am Samir Dhurde, and uh, as always, I'm very happy to welcome you all to the Inter-University Center for Astronomy and Astrophysics, IUCA, as it is popularly known as. And we have been uh, very fortunate to have the company of your teachers, especially. Welcome again. And uh, all of you for a long time in this series of lectures that we call the Second Saturday Lectures. So obviously they happen on the second Saturday, but every month we try to introduce you to and get you to interact with a practicing scientist, somebody who's doing research in any kind of field of science, but especially our favorite field of science, which is astronomy and astrophysics. Okay. So uh, this is the series. And other than that, of course, we have a lot of other programs going on throughout the year which I will slightly introduce you to at the end of the talk, other than taking time now. So getting ahead with today's program of the second Saturday lectures, we have an interesting lecture, again this time about astronomy, astrophysics, in fact about the study of the universe, the early universe, which is a very mysterious part of uh, research. And uh, we will be seeing in this talk how difficult it is to research uh, something about our own universe, but uh, the hurdles which are there, the challenges which are there, and the smart ways which scientists are finding to achieve this task uh, and get over these hurdles. Okay. So to share with this, uh, this with us today, we have uh, Dr. Atridev Chatterjee. So let's uh, welcome him here. So Dr. Atridev is a postdoctoral fellow at Ayuka. And his research topic is, uh, as you know, cosmology, which is the study of uh, the universe, the evolution of the universe, and the way it, uh, it was early and is now. So to present to us uh, this interesting topic about the cosmic dawn and the birth of stars, let us welcome uh, Dr. Chatterjee. Uh, hello, everyone. I hope the, I'm audible in the back as well, right? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so let me first start by saying that I'd like to thank uh, the CYPOC team of Ayuka, who has helped me making these slides. And you will see at some point there will be some demo as well. So they have helped me to do this. I also want to uh, especially thank Somir who has helped me and Mate who has helped me setting up all of these things. And let me be honest with you. So this is the, my first public talk. So I will make mistakes. What I want you to do is to listen to me carefully and point it out to me whenever I make mistakes. So what might happen is that I might go fast, which I should not have, but I will. So please stop me and tell me that I have to slow it down and anything that comes to your mind. Another thing is that I will try to make this as interactive as possible. However, it is possible that I might miss some part. So please interfere, ask me as many questions as you want to. Of course, there will be a dedicated question and answer session at the end of the talk. But whenever you feel any problem in understanding anything, do feel free to ask. So this is the brief outline of the talk. So although the talk is about the fast stars, what I was, what I understood while making the slides is that it may be better to talk about the whole universe. So put that in the proper place where the fast stars will fall. So what we will basically do, we will study the evolution of the universe, how it came, how it took birth, and where we are at this point. And as we will go along, we will see how the fast stars come and what happens and what can they do. Okay. So more or less we know that the birth of the universe happens some 14 billion years ago. However, the problem at this point is that we don't have enough observation to confirm different things when the universe was very, very early. So the problem with that point is that whenever you come up with a theory, and the good way of making a theory is that it should make you some prediction. It can tell you that, look, these things will happen. However, at this point, because we do not know exactly what happens, no matter how beautiful your theory is, it is very hard to know if that theory is a good theory or a bad theory. It may look very nice, but the moment you want to see, OK, let's see if this theory predicts this. And you will see that it does not, because you don't have observation, you don't have telescope that can see what happens at the very early stage of the universe. You just can't see what happens. So that is the problem with this. But however, I will tell you what is more or less the accepted view at this point, 
And please keep an open mind that things might change. And as a scientist, we believe that no matter how good a theory looks like, if we make one observation which does not fit the theory, and there is no way to do it, and then we throw at the theory, no matter how good the theory was. That's how science happens. So what is known is that the universe was very, very hot at the beginning. Can any of you tell me what the temperature was a rough gas will do? Some in Kelvin. Any idea? You don't have to raise hand, just say. Shoot. No, 3,000 at some point, but not at the beginning. Anyone? OK. So it was around billion Kelvins. It was so, so, so hot, you can't even imagine how hot that was. In fact, it was so hot that there was no atoms, no molecules to start with. We only have particles like protons and electrons, and they are moving around freely. And that is all we have at that point, because the temperature was very hot. Just to put things in perspective, let's say we are sitting in this room, and now I increase the temperature of the room. Now it is obvious what will happen is that the air molecules that are roaming around here will have more and more kinetic energy because we know that the kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature of the room, and I am increasing the temperature, so the room, so the air molecule in the room will have more and more kinetic energy. And now think, so we are sitting in a room probably at a temperature of 27 degrees centigrade. And there, we're talking about billions. So there is no atoms, no molecules at this point. And we often call it the primordial soup. We don't have, we only have fundamental particles roaming around. However, and this is what happens. But see, this point, hope it will work, yeah, good. So this is basically the Big Bang when the universe first started. And can any of you tell me what this looks like, this, this, these things? Any idea, any guess? So, atoms. So let me be more precise with this. This is obviously atoms, as you have correctly pointed out. But what are these? These, these balls. Exactly. Exactly. So this is the part I, I am talking about right now. So we have protons and electrons, but be careful that there is no atom. However, what happens is the universe expanded. And that is the theory that we believe at this point. As the universe expands, you can probably feel, let's say I have a room, and now suddenly I'm increasing the volume of the room. So what will happen is the following, that the temperature will decrease. And as time progresses, temperature will decrease more and more, and we'll come in, in details. And then, as someone pointed out, there would be a time when the temperature would be 3,000 Kelvin. And that is the temperature we love. The reason we love this temperature is that this is the temperature at which the atoms could form. The first hydrogen atom could form. And then we will see what will happen. Yeah. And this happens around these times, 380,000 years. And the funny thing is, this is actually known very, very precisely. We know it, exact value. Of course, there is some error, but we know it very exactly. So this is the time when the temperature becomes 3,000 kelvins. Proton and electrons can combine, and they form hydrogen mostly hydrogen atom, but after a little bit, it will also form helium, OK? And this instrument, can any of you tell me what instrument is this? I mean, it's a picture, so <coughs> guess. Any guess? <coughs> yes, what, which telescope? Uh, Hubble, Hubble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So just, just to put things in perspective, we are looking at very, very, very early universe, OK? So Hubble will not give you that level. It is not happening. Mm -hmm. No, that is not James Webb. Come. This is Planck, Planck telescope. And what we will be looking is called cosmic microwave background. Today is not the time to talk a lot about this cosmic microwave background. But let me just tell you, the moment this hydrogen atom forms, and believe it or not, the light that comes from that time, when the first hydrogen atom comes, people can actually go to space and can observe this. Now, this is spectacular. And just think about 380,000 years. It is just after the Big Bang. Now, I have a question for you. What does that 380,000 years mean? So for example, let's say you go to your home. You are talking to your parents or your friends. And your friends ask, look, 380,000 is quite a lot of years. Our lifetime is 70 years, and I'm talking about 380,000 years. So the question is, after 380,000 years, 
what was the state of the universe? It was baby, it was toddler, it was kid, it was like me. Which age was it? In terms of human, because that is easy to comprehend. What do you think? It was very small, it was, you know, it can walk, it can run, it is, it is a teenage boy or girl. What do you think? Maybe. Sorry? Maybe adult. Maybe adult, okay. G guess an age. Give me an age, I need a value. 38 around. 30? 38, okay. Any other guess? Sorry? 16. Okay. Any other guess? And I'm assuming you are talking in terms of years, right? 14 years, 32, 38 years, 16 years. 30 years. Okay. Okay. Let's ask our good friend mathematics what they say about it, okay? And we'll see in a minute. So what I will do is the following, and I want you to participate in this as closely as possible. So assuming that human lifespan is 70 years, okay, which is not an unreasonable assumption. And the universe present is, I have already told you, it is known at some level of, at some precision, it is 14 billion years, okay? Now what I will do, just to make the connection, I will equate that 14 billion years with the human years, because today, I, let's say someone is 70 years, and today universe is uh, some 14 billion years, I'm saying that they are equal. And that will help us to know what, the, what it happened, when it happened. Okay, so just to help you guys, so 14 billion, I'm just dividing it by two, so that would be seven lakh, that is 35 human years. So when I'm talking about seven billion years, it is 35 human years. So someone told me 38 years, however, it, it is not, right? It's seven billion year, un, universe years. Remember, we are talking about epoch of realization, which is three lakh 80,000, much, much low, and you will see. Okay, let's divide it by seven. So that's one billion universe year. And that is five human years. Okay, and remember, we are talking about 3,80,000. Like we have not reached that limit. And if you actually do it, you will find something very interesting. That is literally 16.5 hours of human age. That's not year, that's not month, it is just after the baby born. Okay? So that's what we are talking about. So now I hope you appreciate that it is actually early in the universe. It is not the universe was some 16 years, some teenage or anything. It was just a few hours old, and that's the level we are talking about. And it is beautiful to think about. Even if we have a human life of 70 years, it is hard to think what that person was doing at 16.5 hours of his, of hard or his first life. And this is, I'm talking about the universe. And we have managed to look at this, okay? So let's get back to this figure again. And I will keep showing you this figure one more time. Because I think the main aim of this talk is to get to understand this figure as much as possible. I don't expect you to understand everything. It took me seven years to understand it a little bit. And when I will talk about, I will talk about people who work for over centuries. So I don't expect it to tell you in one hour. That's not the assumption. But we will some get an overview of what is happening. Okay. So now, when I was preparing this slide, I suddenly realized that it might be helpful if we know what universe is made of, and then we ask the question, okay, now I want to see what happens to the universe, set t equal to zero when the universe first formed, and as we are sitting at this point with 14 billion years, okay? So I guess some of you probably saw somewhere uh, that this is basically what we know about the universe's content at this point, at, the, at this present universe. So we know that there is something called a dark energy. The fun part is that we have absolutely no idea what dark energy is. What we do know, however, is that the universe is expanding. We also know that gravity always attracts things. So if something is expanding, so there has to be some kind of a force which will work exactly the opposite of gravity. That we know. Okay? And this, believe it or not, this percentage are extremely accurate, but we have absolutely no idea what these things are. We just know the name. Okay. And this is? This is dark matter, which we know is 27%. Again, the fun part is that we have not very much of a good idea of what dark matter is. What we do know, and the reason, can anyone tell me why it is called dark matter? Any guess? So what has a dark in it? Go ahead. Shoot, shoot, shoot. Why it can't be seen? Why, why, why it can't be seen? There is no light in where? As in, let's say I have a torch. Now I'm looking at this particle. Could I see this particle or not? It absorbs energy. OK. It does not absorb. It is worse than that. It does not interact with light. It has some rivalry with the lights. It decided, I will not talk to you. That's it. 
So it doesn't talk to light. No matter how much you try, you can't see it. Light doesn't talk to dark matter. I don't know why, but they don't. Uh, you also don't know what the dark matter is made of. And it is some other topics maybe we can discuss at some point. Now comes the ordinary matter. But the scientists don't like to call ordinary matter ordinary matter because it just looks very simple. So we call it baryons. We just love them names. So we call it baryons. And the baryons, that is what we are made of, everything is made of, is only 5% of the universe. And that is where we are. So the fun part is we do not know any, we do not have any idea about 95% of the universe, what it is made of. However, we do know very, very precious thing about the universe. And that is the beauty of whatever we are doing. So this is ordinary matter. It's just remember, ordinary matter is only 5%. And we do not know about the 95%. Okay? Okay. So as I was telling you, the dark matter particles decided not to talk to lights. But what they can do is that they can talk to each other. They don't have any problem with talking to each other via gravitation. They have some mass. We have some idea of what the mass is, but let's not go get into that. But they can talk by gravitational force. So what happens is that, because we know that the gravity is always there, this dark matter interacts with each other. They call each other, and they form clumps, and you'll have to call them halos. Okay? So whenever there are, let's say, 1,000 dark matter particles, then these are another, th another 1,000 dark matter particles, they come, they talk to each other, and they form a clumpy structure, and you often call it halos. Okay? Now a funny thing happens. So dark matter is, remember, dark matter is 27% of the universe. Okay? And the baryons, the normal matters, they are 5%. So dark matter is huge, baryons are baby, with respect to them. So what baryons do, just like a kid follow their mom, they just follow the dark matter. They don't know anything. They just, wherever the dark matter goes, they just follow. That's it. Because they have gravitational interaction with them. Okay? And this is one of the figures that I have found. And there, you can see these are called different clusters. Okay? And remember, when I am showing you this figure, we do not have baryons in the simulation. Okay? So what we do is, we only have dark matter particle. We know that they can interact by gravity. And then we can write codes to make figures like this. And whenever you see this structure, you can see that illuminated structure, they are often called filaments. And this structure, as you can see, this, 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 this structure, they are the structure where all these galaxy clusters or galaxies will form. So the more dense it is, the more structure will form, the more galaxy will form, the more star will form. And whenever you see something like this, they are called void. So there is nothing. So dark matter interacts with each other, and the point which was dense becomes more and more dense, and the point which was void becomes more and more void. So there are these black spot, black spot you can see over here. There is no structure formation. Nothing happens over there. All interesting thing happens when they illuminate it. Okay? Oh, by the way, this color, please do not think that this color is something that you see. This color is what I want to put to look with, look nice. I can put blue color, I can put red color, whatever color I want to put. So don't take that impression that when you see it with observation, you can see this. Remember that whatever I am showing you. They are dark matter. So you, by definition, cannot see them by telescope, at least not in a normal way. There are ways to look at it, but not in normal way. OK. I hope this will work. Let's see. So let's look at this simulation first. And I hope, uh, perfect, thank you. OK. So now you can see that there is this dark matter particle simulation. And we are zooming in. And again, make sure that we are changing the color just to give you the impression that that is what you see. Okay. And as you're zooming in, zooming in, you can see that things are happening. This cluster is Milky you know, right? Milky you know, so you can see that more and more structure will form. And that is how structure formation happens. And remember one more thing, that at this point when I'm talking about, there is no star, okay? So there is this particle, but they have not yet formed any star. And now, this will give us the opportunity to look at the birth of first star, okay? So uh, let's try to understand. What happens? So remember, we are talking about epoch of recombination when the first atoms form. So when the structure formation videos that you were looking at, you have seen that there is this blue particle that they were gathering. They are called halos, right? Now remember, dark matter is, sorry, baryons are kid to their mother dark matter. So they just follow. So whenever there is a halo, that means these baryons are normal matter will just follow them. And now what will happen, we will see. And remember, at that point, we only have hydrogen and helium. We do not have anything else. That you should keep in mind, and we will come back to that. OK. OK, so now what do you think could happen? So there are hydrogen and uh, helium atoms. They have one force, which is common to everyone. 
which is called the gravitational force. So the gravitational force is now trying to pull these helium, hydrogen, whatever is there, the only things are hydrogen and helium, to put them together. Do you can, can you think of any other force which will give you the opposite direction? Sorry? Centrifugal force happens when there is a rotation involved. Let's say there is no rotation. What will happen now? No, what? OK. So tricky question. <laughs> OK, not magnetic force. Because at this point, we do not know how to form magnetic field. How can it happen? How, how will the gas pressure uh, take place? What is the origin of the uh, gas pressure? Perfect. So we have a very high temperature, 3,000 Kelvin, not very high. But remember, 3,000 Kelvin is, OK, let me ask you this. So water boiling point is 100 degrees centigrade. So how much Kelvin is that? So that is 10 times. So it is quite hot, by the way. I am just saying it cooled down because it was earlier billion of Kelvin. So now it did cool down, but it's still very hot. So the hydrogen and helium atoms are moving around. And as they pointed out, it will basically have a outward force. However, there is a gravitational force too. And there will be a constant tug of wire between them. So now what happens is, let's say gravity somehow manages to win. And this exact procedure is extremely complicated, and I don't want to get into that. But maybe we can talk later. But if the gravity wins, somehow, let's say it manages to win, then what happens is this hydrogen and helium gas collapse. And this is the only time when the fast starts form. So now can any of you tell me, if this phosphorus is like our sun or unlike our sun? If so, why? Go ahead, go ahead. You don't have to stand, just go ahead. So it is like a? Like our sun. No, it is not like our sun, unfortunately. So what do you think it is? And also, whenever you come up with an answer, do make sure you can reason it properly. So go ahead with that. OK, let me ask you something then. So at this point, there is not only hydrogen and helium, right? There are other materials too. You have, I'm sure you have read it in chemistry that there are other 14,000 materials around. And at that time, remember, you have only hydrogen and helium. And the reason why that first stars are not like sun is exactly because of that. When sun forms, there are already other metals that come and have a very important role to play. I will not tell you about what exact role it plays, but it plays a very important role. However, that part is missing when the fast starts happen. Because when the fast starts happen, remember, there are only hydrogen and helium, nothing else. So you can't do anything other than that. And that is the main difference between the first start and the sun that we see today. OK, good. So this is called cosmic dawn, when the fast starts form. OK? Let's see what happens. And I will tell you later. So this uh, particle that you can see, now I have also put baryons in it. So there is these blue are basically halos, dark matters. And this particle that you can see, they are nothing but baryons. And this is a zoom in version of what we are seeing. Okay? So it basically zooms into this portion. And you can see lots of things are happening, right? And whenever you see any kind of illumination, that is happening from the first stars that they form. And that's how the first star happened. Okay? So we have halos, we have hydrogen and helium, which goes into the halo and then it forms fasters. And although it is not time today to talk about these things, I think Ayuka organizes different workshops. And if you are interested, please talk to the SIPOP team of Ayuka. And they will tell you different way of looking at the star, looking at the star, their lifestyle, their life cycle, and everything. OK? But for today's talk, we will skip to that part. And I will urge you to talk to Sumir or other person in the SIPOP team to talk about this. OK. So good. So in the beginning, I have told you something. Now look, no matter how beautiful your theory looks like, if I don't have any observation, the theory is completely meaningless. Because we can't see if the theory is wrong or right. You can do something, but whether it is right or not, we don't know. So whatever I have told you about this first stars, it could be complete junk, right? I could just tell you some studies which I made with some simulation, some codes. Maybe the codes are all wrong, I don't know, but maybe they are all wrong. We don't know, right? So we have to first ensure that, OK, let's see what observation tells us. And when we talk about observation, at least at those early times, we will talk about HST, Hubble Space Telescope, that can actually give, that has the potential to look at those stars. And of course, the JWST will come. Okay. So now we have HST, we have JWST, and 
and I will come at some point. There are other telescopes that will come at some point called DMT, which Ayuga is a part of. And we will all look at the first stars, and we want to see what happens to the stars. OK? So let me just give you an overview of what we have seen so far. OK? So we have also looked at farthest galaxy. Remember, galaxies are much bigger than stars. For, galaxies are made of millions of stars, right? So galaxies is easy to look at. But looking at stars is a problem, because it is a tiny point. So if you actually look at those images, just try to understand this. These images, which I can't even see at this point, that is one galaxy. And now I'm talking about one millionth of that thing. It is very, very hard to see at different of this. Okay? And this is currently holding the position of the farthest galaxy that you can see. And that is some 33.6 billion light years away, which is quite remarkable. Okay, and this is the first stars. Okay, now look at these stars, and there is a technique which gives you these stars, and unfortunately, I will not talk about these techniques. This is called a gravitational lensing technique. I will not talk about it, I am just telling you for the sake of telling. But the point is that these stars, look how beautiful the ring looks like. Okay, and these stars is called Yarendel, and I think it has some connection with a lot of the rings, but I have never gone through them, so I can't tell you exactly what this is. Okay? So this is the star we have seen so far. Now, let's see. So as I told you, looking at individual star is very difficult. And the farthest star we have seen so far is somewhere around this 28 billion light years away. Okay, that is Yarendel. However, when we are talking about forming the first stars, you must remember that that happens somewhere 34 billion light years away from us. Now let's take a let's go back over there. Now the farthest galaxy that we have seen is 33.6. And I am talking about, I am trying to look at a stars which is 34 billion light years, which is a massively challenging thing. And you have just seen that the galaxy looks like a very small point in the image. Now I am talking about stars, which is very small, of course, in, uh, with respect to the galaxy. And not only that, now I demand that, OK, I will see the stars, but which is actually further from the farthest galaxy we have seen so far. So you can see how challenging the uh, task is. So bad news is we have not seen it. So all the theory that I have told you about, it has some basis, of course, otherwise I would not be telling you about this. But unfortunately, it has not been observed. So all the hydrogen, helium thing that I told you about, they are the, at this point, they are the thing we believe happen, but we have not seen it for sure at ZIP today. Okay? Now the question is, is there an indirect way? It is very clear that to look at fast stars, even JWST, it's hard to say when if JWST can or cannot. So the question is, is there any indirect way? Let's see if there is one. So the question that we have now, now we will be like detectives. Okay? So we can't see the first stars. We don't see who the murderer is, but we see that there is a murder scene. So what we will do, just like a detective, we will look at different clues and try to reconstruct the murder scenario. Right? And that is what we will do. Good. Now I want some help from the SIPOP team to show you some kind of a demo. Because so far it was a very serious science talk. Now we'll have some fun. And we'll see what will happen. Remember, when we are talking about fast stars, all we have is hydrogen and helium. And what is the net charge of any hydrogen or helium? Mm -hmm. Think about it. I am talking about atoms. It can't. Uh, what is the net charge? Now, when I am calculating net charge, I am calculating charge of the electron, I am calculating charge of the proton, and then carefully adding or subtracting. <coughs> okay? Go ahead, go ahead. Zero. Very good. So now, someone told me that ion means charged particle. But we have so far seen hydrogen and helium, which are definitely not charged particles. They always have two protons and two electrons, one proton and one electron, so nothing could happen. Okay. So now, the word that someone told me that ion is talking about some charged particle. Now, let's look at this. Okay. I hope it is uh, visible from the back as well. So this is a toy model. <laughs> Don't take this model too seriously, at least in the hydrogen atom part. So this is our good old proton, right? Proton is much heavier than the electron. And this thing is an electron over here. Now, I hope to do an experiment, and I hope that it will work well, because in most of the cases, it doesn't work well. Let's see. So now what I will do is the following. So what I will do is this. So I have this ball, okay? 
So I will lift this ball from here. So now what would happen is this ball will hit this ball, right? Now when I am doing it from here, when it will reach this ball, it, will, it must have some velocity. And now remember, the kinetic energy is half mv square. OK, good. So now when it will hit, it will impart some energy into it. And we will see what happens. Does this electron go away from this or not? Okay? okay? It doesn't. Okay? Good. Let me just make sure it actually happens. So I will leave it from here. All the conditions are same and hope it don't happen. Good. Very good. So now this is actually a very light ball. Okay? So now what I will do, I will now use a heavier ball. Okay? So heavier balls mean we have a more mass. So half m v square m I am changing. The rest I will keep it as it is. Okay? So what will happen is now it will hit it with a more kinetic energy. Right? Okay, good. Let's see what happens. I will keep everything same. I will I will make sure that it is not moving much. I am putting it exactly here, just what I have done. And I will no, it should not happen. That's a problem. Good. Now I hope this time it will work. No, it doesn't. Okay, good. I will not do the next part of the experiment. But the point I want you to remember is that as I increase the mass of the particle, that means the energy of the particle will increase. And now think of this. When I'm looking at these things, we have electrons, we have protons, we have hydrogen atom. So basically what I am doing is I am looking at the electron of the hydrogen atom and I am hitting it with some energy. In that case, when I will talk about, I will talk about lights. Now, obviously, lights are not balls. Photons, you can't think of it as ball because that would be wrong. But uh, however, light has its own energy. So now what could happen is, depending on which light you are sending, whether the red light or the ultraviolet light or the blue light, what you are sending, it will impart different energy to the electron. And remember, the electron is bound to the proton. So if I can give sufficient energy to that, ener to that electron, then we expect that the electron will go away from it. Now, someone told me ion is charged particle. Now, let's say I throw the electron away. What I will be left with? I will have one proton, and the electron is somewhere there. Okay? So now I have two charged particles, right? One is the proton, one is the electron. So now I will talk about ionization. So whatever I was telling you about now will happen. So I have the incident light. I already told you it has to be ultraviolet. Now remember, ultraviolet light never comes to us because it there, there is ozone sphere and then UV light got absorbed. However, when it comes to cosmology, UV light does come from the first stars. Now remember, when there was no first stars, there was no UV light. The moment the first stars happened, the UV light started to fall from that star. And now, let me again emphasize that at that point, universe was full of hydrogen that we all agree with, right? Now, let's say a star emits a photon of UV energy. So what will happen? As I just saw you, it will hit the electron, as you can see the electron. And remember, this is actually much more correct in the sense that actually quantum mechanics will play its role. So you can't just put a circle and put it like that, OK? The cloud is a much better description, but hard to visualize. So what will happen is now I have a proton and I have an electron, OK? Good. Now remember, when a light comes and does do this kind of a thing, that means this electron will absorb the energy of the light. So now, let's say I have a pointer here. I can put it like that. And let's say I put some hydrogen atom over here. And let's also assume that this is actually UV light, which is not. But now what will happen is, if the UV light finds a hydrogen atom, the hydrogen electron will absorb the energy of the light. It will go away, as a result of which you cannot see the light. Which means, now had I been, have I had a torch in cosmological scale, and I can emit UV light from that torch, and if that light passes the neutral hydrogen, then I can't see the UV light. Right? Because it will go back, because it will hit the electron, throw the electron away, so nothing could happen. So I can't see the light. However, funny thing happens. So let's say these things has happened. So now I have a hydrogen, sorry, I have a proton, and I have an electron. Now if I throw the light, 
as it happens to be the case, now it does not interact much with the electron and the proton. Of course, it does interact, but much, much, much less compared to what it would have been done had it been only a hydrogen atom. Okay. So this is our first terms, but remember this an artistic image, so don't take it literally. So I have this video. Now the, all the black clumps that you can see, they are neutral hydrogen. Neutral hydrogen is black because it absorbs the light. However, look, there are few pockets which you can see and where you can also see that this is slightly, slightly, it has more light, right? Because at that point what happens is these photons hit the hydrogen atom as a result, it becomes ionized. Now, because it is ionized, look at these holes. These holes are getting bigger and bigger, right? So as a result, what is actually happening is that because there is only proton and electron, because the ionization already happened, the light can happily pass through. However, the moment it looks at more and more dark clouds, that is the neutral hydrogen, and this is basically with time. So as time progresses, more and more stars are forming, more and more UV light is coming, and more and more it hits the hydrogen atom, and it make them ionized. And end of the day, at the end of the video, you will see that actually it is full light. Because now, all the hydrogen atoms that are there is, is dissolved into proton and electron. Okay? Good. So this is what happens when the fast stars form. Okay, let it end and then I will ask you questions. there is no dark cloud at all, right? Because all the neutral hydrogen has become ionized. We call it ionized hydrogen because we all have is proton and electron. Now that we have seen something that actually the fast stars which we are good that cannot be seen even by JWST does imprint some clue. Now the question is how could we use this clue to look at them? Anyone with any guess? So the fast stars has happened it produces copious amount of UV light. This UV light hits the hydrogen that are there at that point, and it ionizes them. That part we have done. And now, remember it is all theory at this point. Now, can any of you think of any way where I can use this fact and can come up with an idea where I can actually talk about when the fast starts happen? Anyone with any idea? I agree with you completely, but how do I see it? You have to see it, right? Whatever you have said is absolutely correct. The question is, how do we see it? You have to come up with something where you can do something with some instrument, and then you can say, okay, look, this is what happens. How do I do that? Sorry, say it again. So let's say I make some changes. How, how will I make sure that it does not or does pass through that medium? So you have to make sure that something, either you would see or not see something. Now how do I do it with telescope? That is the question. So of course, there will be some wavelength, as you have rightly said. But how do I actually see it? Let us let us assume a very simplified scenario. I have my JWST. We have infinite time in JWST. We have an infinite sky to look at. Now tell me, how can I verify this? That is the question. Whatever you have said so far is correct. But now you have to do something so that I can actually see it. Right? Or, or not see it, whatever it is. Okay, let's say it captures UV light. Now, what do you say? That there is a hydrogen atom or not? What will you say about it? And also remember that when you will say this statement, you have to make sure where you are doing this experiment, right? Like where the light is coming from, that you have to answer. Uh, how do I do it? By changing the colors of what? No, whatever you have said is perfectly correct. It is spectrum indeed. But how do I, what do you do after that? Okay, good. Let us make another demo. So let me explain to you what he is doing. What he is doing is, I believe he is putting some data in the water. Okay? 
And we will see in a minute why he is doing these things. So now, let me ask you, what do you think could happen to water if I put data in it? Sorry, sorry. So, sorry, say it again. It will? Very good, very good. So it will be more dense. I agree with you, yes. So let's see what happens when these dense things happen. Now, remember that video, OK? In that video, there was first opaque clouds, right, which was black. And we could not see anything. So what we are trying to do over here is that we want to reciprocate that scenario. So what we will do, he has already put some data in this. So now it is very opaque. So we do some cis light. Uh, I think it will come. OK. We see very mild light, right? And now remember that we have already put data in it, which means I am now trying to look at the opaque thing. Now, when we are looking at this opaque video, remember also there was very, very small light, right? Okay. Now, what I will do, what they will do is the following. They will take this data out, rather the water out, and then they will fill it up with a clear water. Okay? So, now, as someone pointed out, data makes it milky, so it makes it more dense, right? So, now, if I have only normal water, it will not be as dense as the data mixed one. So now, what do you think we would expect in terms of light? Will it be brighter? Will it will be more milder? Will it be more faint? What do you think? It will be more bright. Let's first do this experiment. So now they are filling it up with a fresh water. Okay. Very good. So now. Uh, could you please switch off this light? Mm, yes, let's see. So now it is much brighter, right? And that someone has pointed to me that if I put clean water, it will indeed be bright. Now I will do another thing. So what I will do is now I will pass it via this. So there is no water, right? So I am just passing it via air. So obviously it will be more brighter. And now I will. This is a very simple experiment that we have shown. So this is somewhat what we are talking about in these videos as well. Okay? Now, believe it or not, I am using a torch over here. But who will give me the torch in cosmology? I need a torch. I need a background source of light which has to be very beamed so that things happen. Do we need a light? We need a torch. Who will give me torch? Now, there is something called a quasi-stellar object in the sky that we have already seen with HST, with other telescopes as well. So what happens in those galaxies is the following. So there is this galaxy. There are massive galaxies. And in the center of these massive galaxies, black hole forms. And they are called supermassive black holes. They are heavy, heavy weighted black holes. Now what happens is, of course, black hole can't emit light, obviously. That, that is the name. Now what could happen is the black hole has a very high gravitational energy. It can pull things. Now what happens is all the other materials in the galaxy got attracted towards it. And now remember, when two particles collide with each other because of this attraction, particles are coming, they are colliding with each other, and they are coming with very high energy. As a result, whenever they will collide, the temperature will be so high that it will actually emit light. And that we will use as a torch in the background. Okay? And luckily, not only do we have torch, we actually exactly know where the torch is in the sky. So if there is a telescope, it can tell you, look, this torch is there in the sky, some 13, whatever, whatever billion light years away. So you know this exactly. Okay? So what happens is this. Now think of this as our medium. When I was doing this experiment, I was doing it with water or data or whatever, or air. Now I have the quasar, which is the light, which is the torch. It is coming through this, and our telescope is somewhere here. And someone pointed out to me that you need a spectroscope to do that, which is indeed correct, and we will come to that. OK, good. So let's see it again. So the quasar, it is coming. There are some uh, all the other things up there. And then we are here sitting in the earth. OK. Now, let us consider two scenarios. One is where the stars formed late, and in one, the star formed early. Yeah. So this is our quasar. That is the torch I have. This greenish thing is basically the neutral hydrogen in the medium. 
and these are the fasters. Now remember, because fasters form only over here, it basically keeps this part opaque because there is no uh, UV light come. And remember, the direction of the light is this way. Okay, so all the light that is coming from this dark towards me is coming only by this. Okay, however. I am looking at the light that is coming from the quasars. So now when this light is coming from the quasar to my eye, it actually came a long way through this opaque medium. The medium is opaque because the stars are only here. So all this part you can see is transparent because there is no uh, neutral hydrogen. All the hydrogen atom over here is ionized. However, because the star did not yet form, there is a lot of neutral hydrogen. Okay. And the light is coming by neutral hydrogen. And so what someone pointed out to me is indeed what happened. So let's not look at this wavelength. This will we'll, we'll come at some point or maybe will not come. So this is called F. F is for flux. Okay? So this is basically some kind of an unit of intensity. So now look at this value. This is zero, right? Which means <coughs> the equation is here. Light should come to my eye, but because it is coming via this medium we don't see any flux, it is very close to zero, right? So because the stars form somewhere here, now I will change this scenario, just remember this, okay? What I will do is now, so remember earlier the stars were somewhere here, now I put the stars somewhere here, right? So it is basically behind the quasar. Now what happens is when the light from the quasar comes to my eye, in this medium is completely transparent because all we have at this point <coughs> is basically ionized hydrogen. Because the stars from here, not here, stars from here, we can actually make sure we know that this will be transparent, which means the light we can actually see. Now let us look, I will come to it in a bit. So now we will look at this. Now remember earlier the flux was somewhere in zero, right? But now you can see it is non zero. The exact value is immaterial over here. But the point to note is that this happens because of the fact that the stars had happened. So now, if I know the where the quasar sits and look at the quasar light, we can actually tell you whether the stars formed behind the quasar or in, in at the front of the quasars. Right? So that's an indirect way to look when the stars form. Now, remember at this point, the quasar, I know exactly when it happens. So if I know when the quasar happens and I can see the light, I can tell you that, look, I can't tell you whether the stars had happened somewhere here or here, but at least I can tell you it happens behind the quasar. However, when I don't see any light, when I don't see any light, we know that the stars has to form somewhere over here. It could be here or it could be here. To look at it more, you need to look what the value of the intensity is. All these complexities will come. But I want you to get this message that if the stars form early, we can look at quasar spectra and I can tell you when it happens. If the stars form late, we can again look at the quasars and I can tell you when it happens. Good, now so you have a question. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the stars are behind the quasar. Yes. Sir, you should not provide any source of light. It will provide source of light. It will, in fact, because there is a lot of light, we don't see that stars because the light that is coming from the stars are much fainter than the quasars. Quasar will give you a huge light, but just think of it as I have a powerful torch, but behind that powerful torch, I have not so powerful torch. But this light I can't see because it is very small, it is very faint, I can't see. What I can say, however, that this light, what it will do, it will ionize the atom over here. Because it ionizes the atom over here, I can see the torch, I can see the light from the powerful torch. And then I can tell you it happens behind this. However, if I have the same over here, we can't see it because it is very faint, so we can't exactly see the individual stars. However, what I can tell you is that because the first stars happened somewhere here and it ionizes the hydrogen somewhere here, that means the light from here, it will have to pass through a medium which was very opaque. Okay? So we can't see the light and then we can tell. Good. So now we are towards the end of my talk. So remember we have started with the mathematics where you all gave me actually the wrong answer where you all told me that the uh, epoch of recombination on the first hydrogen atom happens at very some 38, 30 years or 20 years of human life but we have indeed find that it is 16.5 years. In fact, let's look at more. 
to the birth of fasters, which I was talking to you about all day long, was happened somewhere in terms of human, sorry, in terms of human age at least, somewhere over here in one year. Okay? So you are still talking about very, very early universe. Remember the universe is 14 billion years old. Okay? In fact, when you look at the first galaxy, farthest galaxy, sorry, farthest galaxy we have seen so far, even then it was only 1.4 year. So even we think that, okay, fine, we are looking at the farthest galaxy, what do I do? But we are actually looking at very early stage of the universe. That is beautiful. And now when I'm talking about farthest star, it shifts a little bit more. It comes somewhere around 4.5 year. And the whole process that I was telling you about, this is called reionization. When this opaque hydrogen becomes transparent due to the light coming from the quasars. Sorry, coming from the first stars. Now the question is, this is called epoch of reionization. Can anyone tell me why it is called epoch of reionization? Epoch is time, so let it be. Why it is called reionization? Any guess? You don't have to raise hand, you just shoot. That's all. Any guess? So re means it happens once more. So the question is why it is called reionization. Well, I could have told it ionization. Why bother about reionization? Yes. So the ionization has to happen somewhere early. That's why the name will should come at least. So yes. Exactly. Exactly. It's a very good answer. Exactly. That is why it is called reionization. Because earlier, when it was this some billion Kelvin temperature, it was that hot, everything was ionized. And now it is happening again. So just to give you an answer, if we look at these telescopes, they are the ones where we expect the future to lie. And in fact, the, you can see this is called 30 meter telescope of TMT, which Ayuka is a part of. So I want all of you to talk to different Ayuka people to talk about how these things work and eventually go ahead and learn more and more, study hard and hard, and then you will, you will be able to look at these data that are coming from all these telescopes and can see what happens. But let me just end it with this slide. So, so far in this talk, we started from somewhere in Big Bang, right? Ah, okay. That should be 16.5 years, my apologies. That should not be 20 hours, 20 hours, okay? So this is when recombination happens. Now recombination means when the first hydrogen and helium happens, okay? Now remember, when there was only hydrogen and helium, I will call it neutral. Neutral because it is only hydrogen and helium and we know the net charge of hydrogen and helium are zero. Therefore, it has to be called neutral. Now, there is a term called IGM. IGM means intergalactic medium. So, anything between two galaxies is called intergalactic medium. Okay? That's why they call it neutral. Now comes the time. Remember, we saw this video where all this structure formation was happening in blue, in different other colors, when all these filaments has happened. Oops. Yeah. So, that is called dark edge because at that point there was no light. And then the first stars happened sometime over here, and the first galaxy happened, and we have not yet seen the first stars. But remember, it was only like one year <coughs> in like human age equivalent one year when we looked at the first stars, when first stars are expected to happen. Then the first galaxies take place, then the reionization takes place that I was telling you about, and the reionization ends around 4.8 year, and somewhere there we are sitting over here. And now if you look at the sky in a cosmological sense, you will see that everything is ionized. So the, yes, go ahead. Sorry? Stars and galaxies. Yes. Sir, uh, if uh, galaxies are more bigger than stars, hmm. sir, why we can't see? We can see galaxies, we can't see stars. Galaxies are bigger than the stars, right? So put some million stars, it will give you one galaxy. I can see one galaxy. I can't see an individual star in that galaxy. Just think of it this way. Let's say my telescope has a resolution of this. It cannot go whatever happens inside this. So I can see a galaxy. That is no problem. 
but the stars are somewhere inside that pixel. Okay, so let's say you take a picture of someone. You can only resolution whatever the camera can give you. So let's say you are using a mobile, say 50 megapixel, right? So you know how many pixels are there, but you can go below one pixel. That is the point that you have you will be hit. So probably you can see my face, but maybe not all the small feature that I have. Right? Exactly that happens over there. You can see the galaxy, no problem. You can't see the stars. So no, that was not stars. Let, let me just emphasize this. <coughs> so that was not star. That was a galaxy. Okay. So this is what we have seen so far. When it comes to stars, it is much closer to us. Right? It's only 28 billion light years. Further, the galaxy was 33.6 billion. Further. There is no problem. Eh? Okay with? So thank you all. Thanks for your active participation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Tridev. Uh, and we enjoyed all the lovely visuals and the videos as well, right? Yeah, they were so thrilling. And this lovely comparison with a human age. Now, I'm sure there are some curious questions in your minds which may have come up. So we can take them for the next five minutes or so. I have to tell you that after this, in about 20 minutes, another uh, version of this lecture is going to be held in this uh, auditorium. So we'll have to, uh, you know, go away f uh, after that. Uh, so let's see if you can put up your hands. We can take maybe two, three questions from the crowd. If you raise your hands, we'll come to you, uh, Tushar, please, uh, with with the mic. Okay. try to solve this problem. It happens everywhere and nobody has a solution. <laughs> sir, yes. basically you said yeah, that... Okay. First of all, don't call me sir. My name is Otri. Call me Otri. Go ahead. Okay. Um, stars are formed by that um, structure which is formed by interaction of dark matter, yes. by that illuminated part of the uh, that structure. But then mm -hmm. what happens to the dark part of that structure? Yeah. So what happens to the dark part we do not know. Okay. However, there is a technique called gravitational lensing technique in which we can tell you a little bit about the dark matter because there is dark matter, the light will bend in a particular way. So from the bending of the light, one can tell you what the dark matter looks like. Then we have models, but we don't see the dark matter with any t uh, telescope at all. Is it? Sir, I want to ask that, uh, yes. like we send uh, Chandra and Mangalyaan on planet, hmm. can we have some missions like we can send some space mission on star to study more about it? Yeah, so it's a very good question. So uh, right now, there is a one program called Pratush, which is made in India. Now they are thinking of putting some telescope in the space to look at these things. And in fact, right now people are talking about putting a telescope on the far side of the moon, okay, to look at these kind of things. So yes, we are, but not at the planet's level, only at moon's level. <coughs> Sir, uh, do we say that we use quasars uh, as a torch, yes. but uh, I think quasars are much rarer. Uh, so how do we find them? And like, uh, even like when we find one or two, are we sure like, uh, means like uh, we will get some stars front of them? So it's a very good question. It is indeed biased. So it is not that the quasars are uniformly distributed in the sky. So we basically, so there are telescopes which looks at sky in different, different region and then we look at them and then we find quasars. But what you have said is absolutely correct. 
it is not that we have quasars everywhere, or at least not at the date shift I want it to be. So we, in that way, we are biased. So for example, there are people who are looking at the northern hemisphere. There are people who are in the southern hemisphere looking at the other quasars. <coughs> and in that way, we have enough evidence for that. But what you have said has more implication in it. In fact, let's say you see a quasar, OK? And you see that the light doesn't come. Now, two things could happen. When I was telling you about all these videos, I was talking to you about you know, on the average what happens. But it is possible that maybe in that particular line of sight, something has happened. And as a result of which, we will be biased. We will come to wrong conclusion. So it is not that we look at one quasar, we look at ensemble of quasars. And then only we say that, OK, look, we have seen, let's say, 100 quasars. It gives me very identical result. So probably that is the thing. In fact, just to make one point, people actually first thought that the reionization thing happened at some earlier red shift, in at some earlier red shift. Now, in fact, people do think that maybe it is not that early. It is slightly towards us. So these things happen. Sir? Yes. Sir, I have doubt oh, in all. Yes. Sir, I have doubt in all us. You have doubt in? Hallows. Hallows, OK. OK, so halos is just a fancy name. So the way to understand is the following. So we have dark matter everywhere in the universe. In fact, we have lots of dark matter in the universe. Now what happens is dark matters can talk to each other. OK, let me ask you something. Let's say we are sitting in a situation where there is no other force other than the gravity. And I gave you four balls. I put it in random direction in this room. And we have no other force, only gravity. OK, not in Earth, somewhere in space. What do you think would happen? What will happen to these four balls? And we are at a space. Okay, so the only force over there is the gravity. So what do you think will happen? Then what will happen? Let's say I am looking it at t equal to zero, and I am looking it at after ten seconds. So what do you think might happen? Very. Good. So it will all come together, right? So this is the exact same thing happens with the dark matter because it is the exact same scenario. They can talk to each other via gravitation. So all the dark matter comes, 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 and accumulates together. And when a lot of dark matter comes and accumulates together, we call it hell. Uh, sir, you said that uh, reionization occurs uh, when- Sorry, say it again. Uh, reionization occurs when uh, the universe was uh, equivalent to one year of human age. I don't think that is correct. Let me check. Yeah, I did this calculation last night, so I don't remember this. Could you go to that slide? Maybe? I think, yeah. Uh, so, no, epoch of reanimation uh, starts somewhere, maybe this one year, 1.4 years, but end at 4.8 years. So, so, what was the event that triggered that uh, reanimation? Very happen? good question, the first starts. The first starts give lots of UV light that will ionize the medium, and that is what we call it reanimation. So, the first starts are the trigger of the reanimation. So, uh, okay, let's let's take a last question. No girls have asked yet, so we'll give you that privilege. Sir, I have a doubt. Oh, three. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so the thing is that you said that if the stars are behind the quasar, <laughs> then um, they are the uh, they are early stars. But if they are in front of the quasar, they are the late stars. So what if? Um, if I am in a particular region on the Earth and I see the stars behind the quasar, but from the other place, what if I see the same stars uh, in front of the quasar? Yeah, so the, it is just that, remember, Earth is a very tiny, 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 tiny point in the universe. It does not happen. It does not so happen. In that, in that in, when you are sitting in Earth looking at a particular quasar, it cannot happen that you will see it in a different direction. Okay. So, like, for example, what you have said would have true if the universe is very small. Then these things could happen. Given the universe is very, 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 very big, these things will not happen. Statistically speaking, it will not happen. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir.